if I could briefly talk about the uh, project. Uh, this project is called Towards a New uh, Dialogue. And it is about providing training for the media, the public and the civil society in order to um, change the discourse on the uh, Syrians. The um, Toplumgen Lirvak for a civil society organization is part of this. Ranting Foundation is running the uh, project. The reason why we're making this webinar at the moment is because we're going to be focusing on a training activity while designing this uh, training. We have made use of the non formal training methods. We would like to use interactive methods and talk about. A, an alternative discourse and anti-discrimination and hate speech. And we have talked to experts from Turkey as well as international experts and how they did this. We have also used the materials of the European uh, the Council of Europe as well. And while we were just designing these activities, the uh, pandemic as a matter of fact started. And that is why we couldn't really roll out the trainings. And as you know, while we switched to the online platforms, many areas such as human rights, uh, an alternative uh, discourse, uh, while getting them onto an online platform, we had certain difficulties while switching to an online platform. And of course, we've spoken to experts about this because we've seen that a lot of people, as a matter of fact, are experiencing the same problems. That is why we're having this discussion at the moment, so that we can talk about the difficulties, the challenges, and how the human rights-based work is going to be affected in the future as well under the pandemic conditions. And to talk about all these issues, we have three uh, speakers. One of them is Menno Etema. He has been working on human rights and trainings in the Council of Europe for a very long time. Özge Sönmez works in the Yuva Association and Hakan Kahraman is going to be actually the moderator of the discussion that is going to take place today. I'm going to briefly introduce him and then give the floor to him. Hakan met civil society while he was in university, as a matter of fact, and he worked as a volunteer in non-governmental organizations operating in different fields. Then he started working at the Community Volunteers uh, Foundation, and uh, during that time he started to uh, think about uh, human rights and he participated in many local, national and international rights-based uh, training as a participant facilitator or trainer and he worked with very different teams uh, that designed uh, training programs, workshops uh, on discrimination, peace and human rights. And he's been working at the Sabanja Foundation since 2017. At this point, I would like to give the floor to uh, Hakan and welcome once again. Thank you very much, Gülşah. I would like to thank the Sabanja University Ranting uh, Foundation Community uh, Volunteers uh, Foundation. And thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to uh, talk about human rights uh, and trainings. Today we have two uh, speakers, Menno and Özge are going to be with us. And we're going to be talking about a non-formal training methodology, both for the pre-pandemic period and also the post-pandemic period. And we're going to be focusing on what kind of changes the non-formal education methods, training methods went uh, through uh, during the pandemic uh, process. I'd like to introduce the speakers uh, first of all. Manu Etema is the program manager at the No Hate Speech and Anti-Discrimination Cooperation Unit at the Council of Europe. And he's also uh, bringing uh, together organizations uh, working on uh, hate uh, speech and anti-discrimination. And they are trying to have a very comprehensive uh, approach, look on addressing hate speech uh, within a human rights framework. Uh, Mr. Etama, 
before worked as the European coordinator for the uh, No Hate Speech movement, which was a youth campaign of the uh, Council of Europe to mobilize young people uh, for uh, human rights and uh, against uh, hate speech uh, uh, online. And he also worked with the youth department of the Council of uh, Europe uh, as well, and he worked with several youth uh, peace organizations in the uh, Middle uh, East. Uh, Menno, could you also briefly maybe introduce yourself in addition uh, to what I said? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me, first of all, and uh, for the organizers to hold such an important event. I don't know what I have much more to add to uh, introducing myself. I think you, uh, you summarized it correctly. Um, I, maybe to add, I studied in, uh, the, I'm from the Netherlands originally, and I studied in Nijmegen uh, psychology of culture and religion. So I think uh, I have a very strong interest in education, learning, and uh, I'm very happy to recently be working uh, within the Council of Europe on hate speech and anti-discrimination. I think these two are very much connected. Uh, hate speech is, of course, a very broad topic, and I think we'll discuss that a bit more. There's many ways of addressing that, and I hope to discuss that. Um, what I think is very important also, maybe or interesting maybe to mention, is that uh, one of the new areas I'm engaging in is also artificial intelligence and discrimination. I think, the, especially now with the pandemic, we're moving more and more in the online space where uh, algorithms, AI, uh, are really influencing uh, information that we have access to, um, things that are uh, provided, a hate speech or non-hate speech that's profiling in, on uh, platforms. It has many, many effects, also access to social services, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is a very rapidly developing field and I'm also engaging now here because I think it's uh, for uh, persons with disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, it's disproportionately affecting them AI. So this is a new development and I think it's very important and links back to all the work that we're doing. And I think it's also hopefully relevant for today. Thank you very much, Menno. The other speaker we have is Ms. Sönmez. She is one of the co-founders of the Yuva Association. She's a graduate of Istanbul University Faculty of uh, Economics and has been working in the civil society on training and education for about 15 years. She works as a content consultant for many civil society organizations, especially after the Syrian uh, crisis. Uh, she start, uh, she uh, worked in the field of inclusive education and also she is working on the school of uh, girls in Turkey uh, with the very uh, respectable title of the Malala Found uh, Education uh, Champion. Thank you very much uh, Hakan for all your kind words and I would like to uh, welcome all the other attendees and speakers uh, here as well. You have a really uh, introduced me well, I think. Therefore, I have no addition to make, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, but I should also say, I believe that I started uh, volunteering, as a matter of fact, for civil society organizations when I was at a university. And I believe that is very important as well. Uh, volunteering is a very important part of all this work. That is why I wanted to mention that too. So, for about uh, eight or nine days for 2010, I was with uh, Menno and I know Asge, I've known Asge for a very long time as well. The non-formal education methods, training methods are going to be the very important part of this discussion as a matter of fact. That is why I believe it is very important to define first of all what non-formal uh, training is. And uh, later on, we're going to be focusing on the human rights uh, based non formal training. That is why I believe it is very important to define it at, the, um, uh, at this point. I feel, as a matter of fact, the non formal uh, training is the sort of training that is provided by NGOs for example, because we're already getting education, formal education, as a matter of fact, is supported by the government, is supported by the state, as provided by the uh, state, but non-formal education is a bit different uh, from that. And it has been implemented, as a matter of fact, to some extent. 
it is under a certain uh, coordination. It can be called informal education, non-formal education or non-formal uh, training. We're going to be talking about the link that has with human rights uh, as well. And also while we're talking about uh, training, you shouldn't uh, think only about getting together uh, around four, in four walls it, and being in a classroom. It is not only about that. And also several sources, for example, also say peer uh, training as well. It could be peer training and it could not be, uh, may or may not be as a matter of fact. So while we say non-formal uh, training, we're talking about the methodologies of uh, training not uh, provided by the state or by the government. But first of all, I'm curious about how the speakers, how the attendees actually went through this uh, pandemic uh, process. Menno, let's start with you. Were you in Strasbourg when the pandemic first hit and how did you go through the process? Yes, indeed. Um, no, I was. We were. Uh, I was with my family in Strasbourg. That's where the Council of Europe's head, uh, headquarters is based, and that's also where I work. Uh, for a few moments, we were tempted to leave Strasbourg to, because the lockdown was happening, and we were all having to go to telework to to go abroad back to the Netherlands. But in the end, we stayed in Strasbourg, and um, it's been a very well stressful at times, but also uh, interesting. I think. Uh, process i mean from a personal level uh i think i have been in a we have been in a privileged uh, situation i mean i had a laptop from work that i took home and uh, we sat at home and i think i really enjoyed being with the family uh, i know that school for example my young daughter we needed to do homeschooling which is on one hand it's a challenge but thank god she's not at an age that i need to do complex mathematics and explain her that so it was very actually uh, enriching experience to be as a family together so there have been positive points to it um, and at the same time it's also been very stressful and i think this is something we all share being home in france you had to have a document every time you left you could only leave one hour uh, the house uh, for two weeks the shelves in our supermarket were um, understocked which adds to the stress level later on it was all fine of course um evolving information uh, constantly not knowing what's going on and how what's the next steps uh, evolving regulations and rules um and yeah we concerns also about uh, and strasbourg was quite the region of strasbourg was heavy hit so there were emergency hospitals built and lots of people ended up in hospital so it was quite uh, in severe i think going from there i think um for us all it's a really a challenge to adapt to the new reality i mean social distancing rules uh wearing masks um changing information and also to be constantly adaptive i mean also now across europe you have new outbreaks and clusters uh, so we need to be flexible and i think that's a new reality also to think about teleworking as a more constant given um from a more professional level, I mean, for us, my, myself and the colleagues, it's been very challenging. We had to reorganize our way of working uh, using new tools, for example, uh, concerns about safety and uh, security. I mean, there were lots of cyber attacks in that period uh, when everything went online. So for a big organization at the Council of Europe, that's very important with lots of private details. So this has been quite difficult. Also engaging with partners, partners went online, partners had to deal with uh, instant emergencies, uh, sicknesses and uh, stuff in the family. So we also had to adapt flexibility, show, I think it was built a personal relationship with our partners sometimes, but we also need to listen carefully to their needs. The needs have really changed. So projects have to be adapted, and negotiations, negotiations with donors to adapt and respond to the urgencies. Um, new topics came up, I think, um, New groups have been targeted by hate speech, for example. Uh, new forms of hate speech have formed, new new concerns. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we see also a lot of uh, old topics in new, like old wine and new bottles. So uh, certain groups have always been discriminated and uh, now again have problems with accessing uh, services, health services, social services, sanitary services. Uh, education, for example, Roma settlements where there's no internet, so how do you do then education from a distance? So I think it's really brought up um, things that we already knew, but put it in a new light and um, mixed experiences. We can discuss that a little bit more in detail later, but I think some uh, 
authorities really stepped up and uh, took measures that were never done before, uh, giving access to healthcare to refugees, for example, or Roma, because it is a con it's an urgent need for the whole population that this is addressed. Um, so, for example, but we also saw uh, very nasty things, uh, racial profiling and very, um, by police, uh, getting more severe and, and, and minorities being severely fined for uh, breaking the rules on, uh, on lockdown rules, for example. So it's been for us uh, an intense period, um, very interesting, intense, emotional. Um, and uh, yeah, we're preparing also for the next potential autumn wave, which everybody's talking about. So we'll have to stay flexible. But that was for me personally. I think uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the pandemic maybe in a few minutes. I think the only thing maybe worth sharing is that uh, I work for the anti-discrimination department and we did draft a, a document uh, documenting some of the issues uh, that are there. I can share it later in the uh, chat, um, which I think is worthwhile considering. It gives a very good description of the challenges that were seen across Europe and also the very positive responses from member states uh, to the challenges. And uh, we are now working uh, as the Council of Europe, specifically anti-discrimination department, we're working on a new policy document to give guidance to member states on how to respond to crisis, crisis situations like this uh, within the human rights framework. So we're working on that. Thank you very much for all this uh, detailed uh, information and explanation, Menno. For, uh, for humans, when you experience such a bad thing, generally people think, as a matter of fact, that that bad thing is only happening to them. Therefore, it is very important to hear about others' experiences as well, I think. Özge, where were you uh, when the uh, pandemic uh, started and what have you been through uh, during the pandemic process? Uh, would you like to share some uh, information about yourself as well? I was in uh, Istanbul and the UVA Association is in Istanbul as well as you know. So at certain times it was difficult for me, at certain points it was a sort of an advantage because I have a very young daughter and I'm sure a lot of mothers went through the same uh, experience as I did as a matter of fact because I was dealing with her development obviously with her education and everything but I was also dealing with my professional responsibilities as well it wasn't easy to manage to be honest but it is nothing compared to what the people who were infected with this disease went through obviously and as an association, as our organization, it wasn't easy for us to adapt because we found ourselves in a situation we have had never been in before, uh, because we have been doing a lot of non-formal training work and face-to-face -face, uh, training, as a matter of fact, since the day that we were founded. Therefore, we needed to think about how we can adapt our work. And of course, the needs of the target groups that we're working with have changed too. As Menno uh, mentioned, access to food, for example, access to sanitation materials, access to shelter or unemployment problems, because we've been working with refugees for a very long time as well. That is a very large uh, part of our target group. Therefore, we need to bring up new solutions about that situation. And we need to think about all of this while reconfiguring our work. And of course, it wasn't easy. We needed to do a lot of research. We needed to adapt. And it is still ongoing, obviously, this uh, type of effort. I mean, of course, the conditions became uh, very challenging. And maybe the problems that already existed were uh, exacerbated by this. And a lot of people think that everything is going very negatively at the moment, but still, yes, we are part of the um, a lucky, uh, privileged uh, minority, as a matter of fact, because there have been people who have lost their job. There have been people who have been if infected with this disease. And I hope that through solidarity, we're going to be helping those people as well. So after this introduction, maybe we can start... So in order to dissipate this very negative mood, let's go before the pandemic is a matter of fact, and let's start with you, Menno. Could you 
talk about some of the methodologies and some of the tools that you use for non-formal training in the Council of Europe. Yes, um, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, it's good to start maybe from reflecting on how it all was before the pandemic. So I think it's a very relevant question to pose. Um, no, I mean, from the, the Council of Europe, I mean, I, I'm wearing now two hats, one from the youth sector, which is working really uh, intensely on human rights education uh, and using non-formal learning methodology, educational methodology, and also address the anti-discriminations work, which is uh, more diverse in that sense. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I think uh, maybe just to recap for the non-formal education, I think what's very important here to, to mention is that it's a planned process. It's a planned educational progress. So while it's not the formal settings of schools, it is really a, a, a planned process. So for us at the Council of Europe, uh, uh, using non-formal education still means that you, you have a program, you have goals, you have learning goals, you have also clearly defined uh, target audience. And with them, you work on their uh, competences. So they gain skills, knowledge, and attitudes uh, related to human rights and how to implement it in their context or in their uh, work environment. And I think this is very important to mention. Um, and then if you look at uh, the, the approach of the youth department specifically, um, for us, for, for the youth sector of the Council of Europe, it's very much working with multipliers. So uh, the Council of Europe is not uh, in a position to work with everyone in Europe and, and therefore we work with multipliers, those who are able to work in their local context or in their national context with others and, and, and therefore distribute the information and the knowledge and the learning uh, further. So for us, uh, the, the, a planned process is very important and we need to really engage with our partners actively and constructively to, 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 to make sure that they gain the knowledge, the skills and the attitudes that they need. Um, within the youth department, there are we developed lots of manuals uh, in this regard, and I would like to uh, to to advocate a little bit for them or PR them a little bit. I mean, Compass, for example, is a is a is a standard manual which gives a lot of uh, background on what is human rights, human rights education, specifically for the youth um, sector. Uh, and if you flip through it, you'll see that uh, half of the manuals actually concrete activities. And this is a typical learning cycle that we go through. We, we create a space where young people uh, engage through uh, an activity, simulation game, let's say, go through an experience, then reflect on the experience, and then the, uh, from that experience, try to translate that into their own context. So what, what does this mean for my life and in my work? And then take some learning from that, and then we try another simulation game. And so that's a whole week-long process of, so going through simulation games, reflecting, some knowledge input, et cetera. So, yeah, from my explanation, it's very clear that we were very physical oriented to have actually physical meetings um, with these multipliers. We, did also we do also blend it. So you had online learning, which is very much based on knowledge gaining, and then you had a physical meeting. Uh, and one of the reasons that we very much build on physical meetings is because you create a safe space. You create a safe space for people to learn, to make mistakes, to, to experience certain things which can be uncomfortable. Uh, learning is also about stepping out of your comfort zone, uh, trying new things, um, and also failing in that. Uh, you can be successful, but you could also sometimes things could not go as you expect, um, especially because we deal with other humans. I mean, human rights education is about the relationship between humans uh, and different emotions and concerns. Uh, perspectives that play. Um, so you need this safe space for the interaction and to reflect together and see different perspectives. And I think that's why for us, human rights education is uh, about uh, educational programs and activities that talk about equality and human dignity. And, and it's combined with working on intercultural learning, on participation, empowering groups that have disadvantaged backgrounds. And all these elements are very well possible in the physical meetings where uh, you can listen to each other, you can create safe spaces or subgroups to work, you can do more one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Um, and of course, there's a lot of learning just by hanging around the coffee uh, and talking with each other about how was that activity for you. Um, so the youth department has many manuals like Compass and when it came to the No Hate Speech Movement uh, youth campaign, which was launched in 2013, 
um, we developed specific manuals called bookmarks on how to use human rights education to address um, hate speech and mobilize young people for human rights in the online space because that was the new challenge human rights online um, and we developed also a manual called we can which was about mobilizing young people to to work on counter narratives so when they come across hate speech how do you respond to it using human rights speech and to actually counter it and provide an alternative which is a human rights alternative now this was very much based on physical meetings and sitting to down learning um, together if I may translate that to the anti-discrimination department where we do also a lot of training and also non-formal learning, uh, even though we don't always call it that way because we deal, for example, with the police, uh, which not necessarily like these kind of terms, but still the capacity building that we do with the police, with the judges, etc., has also elements of formal, but also a lot of non-formal learning. Um, within the education anti-discrimination department, do we do a lot of cooperation work. We have a, a triangle, we would say, so the Council of Europe has standards when it comes to anti-discrimination and discrimination, anti-discrimination and equality. Um, so we have the standards. Uh, then we do monitoring work. So you have, for example, the European Commission Against Racism and Tolerance and others who do monitoring work. And then we have the cooperation, and that's where I come in. So we use the reports from the monitoring bodies and actually sit down with member states, like the national authorities, the law enforcement, judiciary, but also civil society, and say, okay, these are the recommendations and the European standards, what can we do? Uh, and so we do a lot of work around legislative reviews, um, but also capacity building and, uh, and awareness raising. Now, again, this needs a lot of face-to-face -face meetings uh, to actually discuss with a minister or, or a policy advisor on legislative reviews is much easier done in a face-to-face -face -face meeting where there's also an informality and more space to take time and to re, re, re reflect on understand body language same with capacity building activities training courses events um, we we learn a lot we've we've learned a lot we have a lot of experience on actually doing a multi-stakeholder training courses uh, in the anti-discrimination department it was also about the no hate speech movement we for example we've trained we've organized trainings with uh, journalists and minority groups together on hate speech and uh, while they both learned about what's hate speech and how to identify it and respond uh, by bringing those two groups together in one room journalists can understand okay what are the terminologies to use for such a minority group why is gypsy not appreciated by roma and travelers and why should you use this term or that term um, so it's this is another level of learning which I can, exp I can explain them what terms to use, but when they hear it from a Roma person themselves and why and what emotions are behind it, that is, that's the extra level of learning that a physical meeting can give. Um, but also, for example, uh, afterwards we learned that by bringing, bringing them together, they created networks, they understand each other, they know how to find each other. And then when an incident happens in a community, there is a hate crime, for example, involving, uh, involving Roma, a journalist can quickly contact that person that they know from the training course and say, listen, what happened here? What's your perspective? How should I report on this so that I don't uh, reuse stereotypes or start publishing stereotypes? How can I actually frame this issue in a non-discriminatory way and actually give space to you as well? So we've seen that physical meetings help networking, help perspective, different understandings and create a safe space. And I think this is the challenge now with the pandemic and social distancing rules and international travels really being limited it really creates uh, new barriers or new challenges on how to create such a safe space for learning uh, which i think we'll discuss the rest of the session uh, but these are this was the reality before uh, and this is um, um, yeah we had lots of successful examples of working and we've documented this also so i i would encourage you or the participants the listeners to also uh, look at these manuals and, and and take from that because as i'll discuss a little bit later i think many of them can be transformed to an internet uh, to an uh, online space um, um but we'll discuss that in a few minutes thank you very much menno I would like to thank you, especially on the information that you gave us on Compass. So, Compass was a, 
was, as a matter of fact, uh, translated into Turkish as well. But while working on a, a no hate speech, uh, So all the work that you have conducted up, up until now was about non-formal training, for example, bringing together, but there are different uh, methods as well. Again, non-formal training uh, methods, for example, using box games or living libraries, for example. Have you been making use of those kinds of methodologies as well, both on no hate uh, speech movement and also on the anti-discrimination department of the Council of Europe? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for raising this. Indeed, I'm, I'm very much focused now in the training setting, uh, bringing people together in one room and, and working. But uh, you rightly point out non-formal learning uh, can have many places. Um, within the No Hate Speech Movement campaign, uh, for example, many national campaigns, because it was implemented in uh, through national campaigns. So we're bringing together national uh, NGOs, uh, authorities, other actors. Uh, they were working at national level to raise awareness about uh, hate speech or issue of hate speech and why it's a threat to human rights in the online space, but also promoting uh, human rights understanding. And this could have many shapes. I mean, in the summer, there were many uh, festivals organized where living libraries were organized. And living libraries is a, is, is a concept where, um, for example, in the setting of a festival, somebody uh, would come by and there was a stand and then there would be a book with a li which was a a, a diction, not a dictionary, a, a catalog, and they could take out a book called the police officer. And that police officer is then actually a physical person. And uh, the visitor could sit down with the police officer and ask for half an hour anything that they would would like. So we had police officers, a uh, bank robber actually in Hungary, that was a very popular one, but also Roma, Jewish persons, a feminist. There's lots of different uh, people with different characteristics in society which we don't necessarily really know or speak with and and uh, living library is one of those places where you create a safe space for people to ask questions and again learn from each other perspectives so indirectly you're doing a bit of intercultural dialogue inter intercultural understanding um, and, and learning so uh, within the no hate speech movement uh, the youth campaign there was lots of this uh, living libraries um, uh, lots of video materials were developed, uh, memes and things like that were developed, which was also for the online space. You create interesting um, tools to actually engage with people and to see things from different perspectives. That's a good mem uh, gets attention because it takes you, it puts you on the wrong foot. It doesn't confirm your stereotype. It actually challenges your stereotype in a funny way infographics, quizzes, uh, so this is in the online space, many different tools. In the offline space, um, uh, uh, also there were uh, concerts organized, uh, open houses, like uh, we had uh, different religious buildings having open houses uh, where people could meet and discuss experience, etc. Um, yeah, there were many, many, many different uh, tools visible, uh, possible. I think large scale uh, simulation games were also great for youth camps, for example. Um, and, and this all uh, took place. Yeah. In the anti-discrimination department, I think um, the challenges are slightly different uh, because when we deal with the police, uh, law enforcement or national authorities or the journalists, there's always an element more of formal setting. Um, so while we use non-formal learning, it's often in a more formal setting of being in a room and meeting. Um, but also there, there are, uh, there's a need for public awareness raising about anti-discrimination laws and creating understanding for this. So uh, in many countries, we are working with the authorities to update uh, anti-discrimination legislation or specific legislation on uh, uh, safeguarding the rights of certain groups. Once you do this, you also need to create public uh, awareness of these rules. Uh, so, for example, that a certain group, uh, be it Roma or another, that they know how to address these, uh, to use this, their rights. 
So it's about redress mechanisms. And this also, you need to, it's not only about hanging up a poster, it's also about engaging in dialogue and discussions, uh, town hall meetings to discuss issues. And meanwhile, educate about uh, redress mechanisms or rights that are there. But you also need to reach the general population so that they are supportive to such, um, such legislation. Um, you hear too often that it's, uh, that group has more rights than I have. Uh, women have more rights as often women have more rights than men, which I don't think um, is the right understanding of what um, equality regulations uh, laws are about. It's about creating a um, setting where everybody has equal opportunities to benefit from the rights that they have. And some people have uh, structural disadvantages in accessing uh, certain services or certain rights. And this is a, a mind shift that you need to work on. So awareness raising uh, to the general public is very important. And education, again, plays there a very important role. Again, using MEMS and, and, and videos, et cetera, but also activities, face-to-face uh, -face activities at schools, uh, community events, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, the Council of Europe's role is here to work with the multipliers. So we work with NGOs, uh, law enforcement agencies, etc., and train individuals in that that can then train others and that then the work with the community. So, thank you very much. Generally, when we talk about discrimination, hate speech in this kind kinds of human rights based work, we talk about a group that's the victim and a group that's violating. But generally, there is another group that's silent, that does not belong to any of these two groups. So we need to empower them as well. So it was very important what you said. Thank you very much. Now I would like to turn to Özge. Özge, we are going to take the perspective of Turkey. If you like, we can start with Yuva and then generalize the speech. So at Yuva, what kind of work do you carry out uh, in this manner? We are still talking about the before pandemic uh, era, by the way. Yes, of course. Yuva uh, combines uh, adult training, child training and environment uh, work. And since uh, 2017, we work on non-formal uh, training as well. So an important part of our work is uh, targets, actually, uh, adults that are above the age of 18. We have a World Citizen Program, as we call it, and one of the trainings that we deliver under this program is very related to the topic that we have today. It is related to combating hate speech and discrimination, uh, living together, migration, and social cohesion, we call it. So what we try to do through these trainings, we try to bring together the uh, migrating community and the local community. We bring them together. We talk to them about what it means to be a migrant, uh, what it is, uh, what discrimination is, uh, what kind of discrimination are we faced to, uh, what are the speeches related to discrimination, etc. And we discuss whether it is possible to live together or not, and how uh, can this be possible? This is what we talk about. The participation is open to everyone, by the way. And another training that we have is global literacy. Ecological literacy and sustainability is included in it. And there we talk about the rights of the nature, the rights of the planet, the rights of the world. How can we live without damaging our world? How can we coexist with other living beings? This is a training program where we talk about all this. And we can also talk about whether this is can, this can be considered as non-formal training. We have beneficiaries and we try to uh, give them vocational skills directly. We work with people that do not have jobs 
uh, or competences and we try to give them uh, vocational skills. And finally, we have a training on life skills. This includes living in a multicultural environment, working in a multicultural environment, mediation, communication techniques, uh, etc. There we talk about tools that help us in our daily life. So before the pandemic, Yuva delivered these trainings in Turkey. Target groups differ. Actually, we have a comprehensive uh, target group. All uh, civilians can attend these trainings under these headings that I just mentioned. So if you think that you can you need these trainings you can participate and in addition to this we have non-formal trainings for local administration workers uh, we work with teachers uh, as well under uh, these settings that i just cited when it comes to our method maybe i should talk about the method that we use as well in general Yuva prepares a training of the trainer and those people who attend this training, uh, they go where they live and they transmit this training to the local communities. This is the method that we use to dissipate this, uh, these kinds of trainings. So our uh, employees at the association, they don't directly go to the site, but we use the trainers. Your mic is off, Hakan. Yes. I'm not very used to moderating these kinds of meetings. Please excuse me. Now, to elaborate on this, you cited three headings. Why does Yuva choose non-formal training methods uh, for these kinds of trainings? Why not formal trainings? So, if you would like to elaborate on that. Yes, why do we use non-formal training? Because principles and values of non-formal uh, training and the change that we would like to inspire, they uh, match each other. So, uh, what do I mean? First of all, non-formal training incites you to uh, critical thinking, actually, to think critically not to accept what you heard, but to do some research on it, to question it. So this is why we opt for non-formal training. This is one of the reasons. The second one is that it's not ob obligatory. It's not compulsory. For example, I have no idea about migration, let's say, or I have no idea about human rights and I would like to learn about it. Then I would like to, vol uh, I can volunteer to be a part of this training. Nobody tells me that I have to get this uh, training, uh, but I volunteer and we believe that this is important. And another reason is that this is needs-based and needs are not defined by the institutions or by the people uh, of the association. We don't just sit around the table and say, we have to uh, talk about migration today. No, we uh, make, we do some research uh, and we decide that there's a need uh, for this. And then we organize this training. And then we also choose uh, non-formal education because it allows us to continue this training um, over a lifetime. We always care about the following, the team that design the trainings, that deliver the trainings, and for the participants, the learning process continues all the time. The teams learn from each other. Trainers and trainees, they learn from each other. Participants, they learn from each other. And this process continues after uh, the training is finished. This is why Yuba also opts for non-formal education, uh, non-formal training. The, skills uh, are changed, the attitudes are changed uh, uh, within the scope of non-formal training. This changes the individual and then the society. And it helps create a more just 
uh, an equal world. Okay, thank you very much. Another question. If we are to talk about the whole country, Turkey, about non-formal education, non-formal training, what would you like to say? You use different methods, you use different tools. We worked with different institutions with you as well, and you used a variety of tools. So uh, how was it going, in your opinion, before the pandemic? Well, if we are talking about human rights and discrimination, I believe getting together is very important for parties to get together is very important. For example, when we started working on migration, we were not an expert on this issue as an institution, but we were an expert on uh, delivering trainings. And the first thing that we focused on was that uh, we knew that there was a flux of refugees. A lot of people came to Turkey and they had to adapt to life in Turkey, so they needed support. This is how we worked at first, but then we were faced with discrimination and hate speech hate speech on both sides. So we said that uh, we had to uh, focus on this issue based on the research that we carried out. So we developed a training program and it was very valuable for us to hear the following, to say the following. Well, this is not what I thought. I thought this was right, but actually this was wrong. I had never thought about this before. We carried out some research with women as well. Women, they did not even look at each other when they lived right next to each other. But thanks to this program, now they are able to form networks, solidarity networks. So I believe that non-formal training uh, activities are very important in this field, but they need to get together. Uh, getting together and creating these safe spaces uh, are very important. Let's talk later about how we can carry out these uh, activities in the pandemic era. Yes, there are many negative sides, negative points of the pandemic, but maybe there are some positive sides to be explored. Let's talk about that. Menno, I would like to start with you. We all know and we all see that people belonging to disadvantaged groups are affected more by this process, by this pandemic, as is the case for many uh, negative developments in the world. For example, in Turkey, violence against women increased in Turkey when people were locked down at their homes. And this is true for other disadvantaged groups. It is not easy to work on human rights and discrimination because we touch upon people's uh, values that are very important to them. This could be their faith, this could be their culture. So it's not easy to talk about discrimination and human rights. It's not easy to persuade people at times. And now on top of that, we have the pandemic. And we can no longer bring together groups physically. So, Along with the conditions, with these new conditions, uh, how, the, how did the activities of the Council of Europe change? What did you start to do with this new era of pandemic? Yes, thank you very much. Um, no, I think, I mean, you zoomed, you just mentioned one of the examples, but I think there are many, many examples, as you rightly say, where the pandemic has uh, uh, exaggerated the or made worse the existing problems or challenges that uh, that exist. I think violence against uh, women, domestic in the in the home space, domestic violence is is uh, is a very clear example. My colleagues in the um, in the um, Istanbul Convention uh, monitoring bodies have been following this quite closely. Uh, we've seen um, and have been reporting on this, and I think there's been a sh uh, social media awareness raising campaign uh, halfway the campaign, halfway the pandemic to start raising awareness of these issues. I mean, I think it's also important here to acknowledge that mem some member states have really stepped up uh, and developed uh, suggestions. For example, uh, in France, uh, there was the possibility because a certain 
shops stayed open, like pharmacies and supermarkets. So one of the options was for pharmacies to use a certain code word, and then the pharmacist knew that there was domestic violence uh, affecting that woman, and then they would be able to notify the authorities, and then follow-up steps would be taken. So there's there is ways to address these issues, and I think we need to um, to to learn uh, now quickly from positive examples uh, of what can be done to address these uh, groups that are at risk. Um, I mean, it's not only domestic, domestic violence can target many different people. I mean, it can be young people, uh, youth, children, uh, we've seen issues there. Uh, also, uh, LGBT persons that are stuck at home, um, have or have not come out. Uh, so there's many uh, issues there. Um, in general, for people to be stuck at home is challenging. Uh, we've seen also violence uh, in families which would otherwise be very healthy and fine, but because just being confined in very small spaces has uh, created problems. So I think here you see police also having to learn how to mediate in a community, how to mediate in families, uh, where not necessarily there's bad intent, but just being stuck so close to each other has been a challenge. Um, uh, one of the interesting examples is, for example, um, the we have a program called Anti-Rumors Campaign from the Intercultural Cities Program, which is working with um, cities uh, across Europe and, and globally, actually, there's also other uh, country, uh, countries outside Europe part, where they work with municipalities on intercultural uh, dialogue and intercultural learning. Um, and one of the projects, for example, in Spain has been to uh, work on uh, diversity policing, to actually train police uh, to, to engage in a community uh, through dialogue with an understanding of intercultural differences uh, and to be sensitive to that, to also be open. I mean, we're not expecting the police to know everything, but to be able to pick up clues, to listen uh, and to have a skill set that can adapt to a setting uh, sensitive to to what's the needs there. And I think uh, many municipalities have been struggling specifically on how to address the, the pandemic and how to uh, um, communicate uh, pandemic uh, legislation and measures and also to mediate in communities uh, to address issues. Um, so there are very positive examples and I think there are tools out there that we now need to uh, maybe adapt but also further strengthen. So diversity policing uh, is one of them, dealing with et uh, ethnic profiling by police and law enforcement that really needs to be tackled very quickly because it has a massive impact now on the on the lockdown. As I mentioned earlier, I mean, there's been racial profiling in, in uh, distributing fines and other measures for those who have violated uh, the lockdowns. Um, I mean, one of the other challenges has been, for example, access to information. Um, which I think is very important to think about is like language barriers, minority groups, refugees, others, um, ethnic, ethnic minorities with their own ethnic languages. They do not have access to the information that we have, um, the general population, uh, when it comes to lockdown measures, sanitary measures, uh, but also to know where clusters are, what to avoid, etc. And this is uh, making their situation worse. Um, and this is, we know this already from before the pandemic. This has been a problem, um, but now it just becomes very acute. We, we see it straight away. We see it instantly. Um, and this creates new problems. Uh, there's in one member state where there was uh, the first case of uh, COVID was in a minority group, uh, community, minority community, national minority community. And as soon as this was known, uh, in the news, there were calls to boycott certain uh, shops, uh, certain chains, because national those minorities tended to work there as uh, like supermarkets where they were filling the shelves. So the lower um, uh, uh, lower lower salary uh, functions, but because they worked there, uh, there was a call to boycott these kind of shops. So it had an add-on. And that led to new discrimination cases, hate speech, et cetera, like that. And this is where we need to quickly intervene. And this is where we're hoping that members, that the authorities, the ombuds offices, but also journalists take uh, their responsibilities and respond uh, very quickly to address this. So I think there are many, many uh, concerns that needs to be addressed. 
how to address this now through non-formal learning because that's your your question if i understand correctly um we've we've um we were lucky enough to have already networks uh so we we know our partners uh we know our multipliers so the first step that we had to take is to listen to them uh, and to also give them space to organize so um we've been asking them how they're doing the personal touch i think that's very important uh, everyone is human in the end and has emotion so we need to give that space so that was step one to organize what's happening to ask what's happening um give them tips on how to organize for things not to forget and give them space to identify the issues and for them to be in touch with the community so that was step one to actually understand the needs and that is also also part of non-formal learning if you respond to their needs you don't decide yourself what you think they need you listen to them and you try to understand what are the needs what are the concerns what do they need to know uh, learn and skills and attitudes to address so that was step one um then from there we continue we we built our uh bar networks i mean we also need to start um there's two tracks here maybe one point to raise is the needs are different nowadays um and sometimes we had to go back to our donors and for because we are also funded in certain aspects uh go back to our donors and say okay instead of organizing more physical trainings what we actually need is laptops or we need much more printing or more we need more translation of materials um, so that everybody's informed so part of our work has been to change our approach um, so it's not only about education now it's also about responding to direct needs uh, be it internet connections be it providing information be it providing more translation for documents or give, uh, and being active constantly updating these kind of websites building websites so we've been giving grants and and other means to to help our uh, part Partners, uh, respond to the crisis but when, when it comes to the education uh, we've adapted um, our education work I mean the there's the more the emergency response of organizing uh, specifically pandemic related uh, in one of our member states we started instead of having a town hall time town hall kind of meetings in communities we started to organize webinars um, and we invited and we phrased the webinars in, in the light of the pandemic. So we responded to the questions and issues of the communities through webinars. Um, the advantage we found, and this is something to reflect on, the, advan the advantage of webinars is that you reach more people and people that you would normally not reach. Um, so when we had a webinar on, uh, on LGBT issues, for example, lots of LGBT persons who would normally not dare to follow such events or come to such an event were able to follow through um, youtube or other means a webinar um, and get information that they would otherwise have more difficulties to access so this has been uh, an advantage um, we also saw that uh, and but not only lgbt i mean we have seen many communities that are now uh, act they can engage more directly with uh, people uh, using webinars and these kind of platforms of course they benefited from already having communication channels so because you're already established you can communicate that you're organizing webinars and you can reach a wide population so this has been one strategy to organize webinars to to allow for a Q&A using the moderation activities or what we've done in one of the countries we organized webinars but then we put it on Facebook live and people could comment in the Facebook Live page, and then we would bring that back to the webinar. So there's also, so you could even reach a wider audience and still have a level of uh, interaction. Here, when it comes to education, what's interesting is as soon as you've done the webinar, you leave the, uh, the video online. That's a decision you need to make, but we have done it a few times. Um, you had comments. So when you had a video on Facebook, you had comments um for and against and different opinions questions so we actively moderated this and this is part of your educational tasks you can follow a debate uh discussions questions that people might have following the after they see the video or, or on issues on the videos and you can respond to that and this is part of the non-formal learning you give provide skill you provide knowledge uh, that people raise um, and this is something to to plan you need to have the, the necessary people that know the answers that can respond to this 
so you need to plan this uh, well uh, but it's, it's been a very educational process in that sense and interactive and participatory um, one criticism though is when it comes to webinars i think while it's more accessible because i mean not everybody has time to leave their job and follow a webinar but they can follow a webinar during the lunch break uh, to go to a physical meeting they can't do that because they have their jobs but for a lunch break they can follow a webinar the challenge here is of course keeping attention uh, so in a meeting you can see from body language who's engaged and you can engage with them and bring them back to the discussion in the online space you don't see everybody that's there uh, you don't know if they are working on their social media or something or if, if they are actually listening to you and just making notes so there's been these kind of challenges of how do you respond to how do you keep people engaged? Um, so Q and A's, uh, asking questions has been, uh, been very important in trying to uh, keep uh, engaged and participatory. Um, I think one uh, thing I wanted to raise here is uh, this is the more generic and we've been responding to that. When it comes to specific capacity building training, uh, which is part of our work, um, here we've seen that, well, we had to practice and learn on the job, but it is possible to do a lot online um and there are like we do in training courses where you maybe do start with the plenary introduction and then you ask them to split in smaller groups to work on a question and then come back and feed back to the plenary you can organize this in an online platform of course this needs a lot of more technical planning so you need a bigger team you need a team that deals with the technical things and you need a team that deals with the content and i think that's precisely what's happening also in this webinar so you need to start thinking here you need a technical people that know the techniques so that they can take away the stress about the technique and I let the participants focus on the content and the moderators focus on the content that's really important so if you have technicians that can deal with these technical sites you can create space for learning and this is very important you need to take away these barriers um, you can work with plenary subgroups bringing back to the plenary you need to then uh, summarize well you need to keep a good record and you need to um, still keep notes and possibly note, uh, post these notes afterwards. I've, I've learned that for people to take notes in the online space is often much more difficult. Uh, so we've been trying to keep notes and post this or post the video so that people can uh, read back. Now, one of the challenges, of course, is when you're doing a physical training, you can follow people afterwards. They might still have questions. They come to you and they ask questions. You have the coffee break to reflect further. This is not possible in a physical meeting. I find it very difficult. I mean, we're done with the one and a half hour session. We press leave, we switch off and that's it. You never hear each other again. Um, so we've really set up trainings to last over a period of time. Several webinars, for example, with some assignments in the middle where there's a possibility for a, a personal uh, monitoring, uh, mentoring kind of engagement. So I think beyond, beyond the, the group work, in the physical space, mentoring is, has become very important. You actually need to follow up with people to check if they understood what's happening, if they have questions, uh, further reflections. They also need time to reflect. So you also need to do mentoring over a period of time. So maybe after a day you ask, okay, how was yesterday? It can also be less intense. Uh, looking at a screen is very tiring. So we've, instead of doing a training course for two days, which we used to do a lot with the edu education, uh, uh, anti-discrimination department, you have a one day or two day session. Uh, now it's uh, two or three weeks, but we have a few sessions of two hours or three hours or a morning, etc. So we've spaced it out more. Um, the advantage is that learning can be deeper. People can reflect on it, check more, read more, come back with more interesting questions often. So there has been advantages, uh, but there's also the risks of dropout, et cetera, and it takes more time. So it is all about more planning. Um, so it has back and forth. So we've been working on these things. Um, what I think is very important here is a few things that we would not think about in a physical meeting, but we do, in a way we, but, uh, but we do. Um, and that this is safety. I mean, when we start a physical meeting, we always ask at the first moment is that, okay, whatever is discussed in the group stays in the group and not to share, not to use social media during an, a session. And this, I think, is in the online space even more important. The, um, the risks that 
things that you say in the online space are recorded and then put somewhere else and then leads its own life out of context is, is much higher. And, and this um, leads to self-censorship among certain groups, especially those who are already from a disadvantaged background or are already nervous uh, due to previous experiences, that won't work. Um, so you need to really make sure that you are very clear on this, that you create a very safe space and you might need to work in a few steps. We've had uh, pre-meetings uh, with certain people uh, to take away some of these fears. So partly is the technical fear to train them techniques, but also partly is the fear about, okay, but is it being recorded? What happens then? Uh, what are the risks that I run and how does it work? This also means explaining them how cookies work, how the settings should be on the phone or whatever platform they use. So there's a few of these security issues that you need to look into. Um, so I would advise any NGO or anybody who's organizing a seminar or online training to do some research before which kind of platforms do you use? And the more sensitive your topics, the more you need to think about these kind of things um, and be critical about who you can Google it and then say, okay, is this Zoom safe? And then of course the first few hits would say yes. So you also need to check who did the analysis of the safety settings and things like that. So these for me are uh, concerns that you need to address specifically when you deal with certain such sensitive issues. Um, finally, I would like to say, um, there's probably more to say, but I would like to stop here and then give my colleagues and then we can continue the discussion. But one of the things I would like to say is that um, don't exclude offline events completely. So while um, at the moment, during the lockdown, of course, it was difficult, but we are now in a stage where through, with social distancing and other measures, offline events are possible. And for the Council of Europe, we're very used to having international meetings, flying in everyone or flying experts to country X, Y, or Z. That's not possible or it's very complex. But still, you can have a physical meeting in a national country and bring in an international expert through video link. So you could do some kind of blended work. And I think we need to keep that option open uh, to do, for example, online training, but then also organize a physical meeting afterwards or during the process so that people know each other already a little bit. So that you've had some of this benefit of getting to know each other through the online space and then actually create a space where people can have this informal space for, for networking, getting building a bit more trust, asking further questions over coffee um, and providing maybe uh, doing a simulation game or an exercise which is more difficult in the online space so you should not exclude um, offline meetings or physical meetings but you need to be wise and flexible um, and consider maybe doing few um, but if you organize a few meetings you need to make sure that if it's part of your intent to have multi-stakeholder so to have for example, for me, a law enforcement and NGOs, et cetera, in one space. And even if there is a big group, you do more than one meeting. Uh, but then you keep that diversity and, and communicate between groups of what happens in one, what happens in the other. So it's also a lot about transparency here uh, for people to understand what's happening, uh, but guiding the process. So while you need to be transparent and providing information what happened, you also need to be uh, short and to the point so people can quickly follow and don't get lost um, because that's another risk in the online space everything gets documented if you want and that's too much information to handle so if you want to continue a process and not redo every time the same information you would need to recap what was said summary and then continue um, so these are some of the things that we've learned I think there's much more to say but maybe my colleague wants to discuss uh, share some of uh, her experiences first and then we can add uh, continue. Thank you very much. Also, I would like to ask both of you to uh, answer in summary because we will give a question and answer session for the people who are listening to us at the moment as well. And if we have anything that we uh, have uh, missed during our speech, we can also uh, add to it during the question and answer session as well. Now, Özge, what kind of changes have you seen in terms of the methodology, in terms of the methods in your activities locally or around the country? 
I agree with everything that Mano has said. All the advantages and the disadvantages he has mentioned are true for Turkey as well. Therefore, I'm not going to be repeating them. But I can say very clearly that an online training can never replace a physical training because the training is not solely about its content. It is about what you share there. It's about the interaction that you have there. And even just as a matter of fact, focusing on the curriculum of the training is a challenge when the training is solely online. And of course, online method, the online method, the online training was not a method that we prioritized before, but now we had to do it, obviously. And especially during lockdown period, when we were at home, I and my colleagues went into a lot of trainings about how to design an online training, about what kind of tools you can use uh, in online tra training, how many people should there be in an online training. So we learned about this first of all, and then we started to try it out. And we don't just do it on our own, as a matter of fact, because we have a lot of relationship with other NGOs as well, and we share the best practices that we find about online trainings. I'd also like to mention that, especially on human rights, on uh, hate speech, on anti-discrimination, while working on those issues, when you go to online training, first of all, you need to be sure that no one is left behind. What do I mean by this? All the, wh whether the training uh, is accessible to all our target groups, we need to make sure of that. And we have had a little bit of difficulty about this as a matter of why, because online trainings have certain advantages and certain disadvantages. We would like to provide that training, but the target group, for example, that we're working with, do they have an internet connection? Do they have a certain device with which to connect? Do they have a smartphone, for example? Whether they have the skills to use it or not? These are important questions to consider. And some of the target groups that we work with didn't have this. That is why we, before going into online trainings for about one and a half months, we first of all had a survey about this. And then for the uh, people who were illiterate in using computers, in using emails, in, in connecting to a Zoom meeting, for example, we have uh, given them information about all of this. And we have done this uh, in one-on-one -on -one meetings, of course, um, applying the social distancing measures. And after that, we have gone into the online training uh, methods. But of course, not everything was perfect while we did it. And also while working with disadvantaged groups, we could deliver, we could distribute the training materials with all the notebooks and the pencils and pens and everything when we had physical meetings. But if the target group that uh, we are working with didn't have that kind of an uh, opportunity, we needed to know about this. That is why we provided training kits in small boxes including the training materials, the books, the notebooks, and the pens and pencils. And we uh, provided those kits to them and then uh, started the online training. Also, for some groups, the online training had some advantages as well. Menno mentioned this, for example, in terms of time, in terms of timing, that was a, a disadvantage. Uh, sorry, that was, a, that was an advantage. And also, especially for people who spent a lot of time on the computer or for people who had other responsibilities in their lives, that was a very advantageous thing too. And we can see, for example, that women participate more in trainings at the moment because they are done online. And 
because they don't have to spend money on transport, for example, or something like that, then it is easier for people who had to deal with those issues um, uh, to uh, participate in online trainings too. And also you can have simultaneous interpretation in the online uh, uh, meetings as well. And nobody tells you, for example, you lack this document, you lack, um, uh, and, the, and therefore you can't participate in that meeting. You can't say that to a person who's going to engage in online trainings. But we don't know at the moment how much contribution online trainings make into social inclusion. We don't have any data about this at the moment. And we, to be honest, don't have any data on the impact of online trainings either and digital technology is not usable for everyone, as I told you before, but it appears that in the post-pandemic period, we're going to have a more, uh, more of a hybrid uh, way of conducting meetings, including both online trainings and physical trainings. And that is how we need to develop our training programs further as we go, uh, as we go along, I think. And that is what we're planning to do at the moment, hybrid uh, mixed methods. Thank you very much to both of you. If I could just uh, summarize all that has been said before opening up the question and answer session. You both have mentioned that human rights trainings and anti-discrimination trainings had to evolve to some extent because everybody started to deal with the issues that they were faced with personally and a trainer, for example, had to act as a trainer, but also deal with their own responsibilities at home as well. Like trainers like us, for example, because they had to deal with their children's and educa education and everything else. And they had professional responsibilities on top of those. So I believe that the non-formal human rights uh, training, first of all, focused on what kind of needs people had because people had to revert to their homes and stay there and that is why you needed to focus on what kind of needs people had at that time so you started like this first of all rather than continuing as uh, in the pre-pandemic period and then you had a look into what people needed. For example, as you've just mentioned this, you had a survey about what kind of opportunities people had in terms of their internet use of digital, digital uh, methods. And I believe that there's a survey, as a matter of fact, about what people use in a household, the internet connection or the uh, communication methods. And it was the men, for example, uh, as far as I remember, that uh, was brought up in a survey. And then the time, uh, that everybody uh, can use these uh, opportunities in a household and women got uh, less time using um, these uh, digital uh, methods. And then you mentioned that there were some advantages to online trainings as well. For some people, the physical training was inaccessible, for example, and they could uh, reach that training uh, online. And Non-form in non-formal education, non-formal training, for example, um, it was said before that people could focus really focus on what was being uh, provided to them for about sixty to ninety minutes. But now maybe online trainings, for example, in, in online trainings you could only focus for about forty to fifty minutes. And then it was also mentioned that maybe there could be a hybrid method, maybe there could be physical meetings, for example, and then at the end of them, um, online meetings or a hybrid method of physical meetings and online meetings. And also parallel sessions could be done uh, on uh, platforms like Zoom. And of course, the hybrid method is going to be, it seems, the priority in the post-pandemic period without giving up on physical uh, training. 
because it is very important to get engaged in that way as well in a physical uh, setting. It was mentioned by the speakers. So do, do you have any addition to the summary as a matter of fact, if you'd like to, then we can take your comments or your contribution and then we can start getting questions. Menno or Özge, do you have any additions to make about this, uh, to this uh, summary? No, I think it's a good summary. I th um, the only thing I was reflecting on when Oscar was speaking is also, for example, groups that have difficulties reaching physical meetings are persons with disabilities, for example. Uh, for them, there's also lots of opportunities now to engage. At the same time, we need to, and I think we should, uh, but this means we also again need to think about the platforms and the tools that we use, because not all digital tools are uh, disability friendly. Not everything can, for example, work for persons that are blind because they don't do screen reading. Uh, certain things uh, need uh, all kinds of other technical uh, limitations, uh, sizing up uh, text. Um, so again, um, it's, it's an opportunity to involve that group in our work, uh, persons with disabilities, um, relatively cheaper, uh, because sometimes involving people with disabilities can have high costs for taking away physical uh, barriers. And it, but at the same time, we should not just think that digital is, is the solution to everything. There's still barriers in the digital tools that you need to think about. So this is something I invite you and, uh, and I challenge you to do, because I think this is a, a good opportunity to uh, work with that community as well. Thank you very much. Özge, do you have any additions? Uh, I suppose not. Then, if you have any questions to the speakers, we can uh, take your questions. I believe that some colleagues from the team are going to be assisting me in taking those questions. So you can raise your hand um, at this point, Gülşah had mentioned where that button is, or if we're not really that crowded, maybe you can just unmute yourself and ask your question as well. And of course, it is always a bit more exciting for the people who are going to ask the first questions in these meetings. So they might be nervous, but I urge you to ask questions. So we're going live on uh, social media as well. I believe that there were no questions there, but uh, Riveda from the from an, att an attendee here would like to ask a question. You can unmute yourself, Riveda. I believe I can't unmute Raveda. Can you hear me now? Yes. First of all, I'm a person who's a newbie, as a matter of fact, in this area. I have just uh, uh, become a lawyer in this area, and I have started writing a thesis on this issue, on uh, discrimination. Can we, uh, uh, can I, as a lawyer, for example, participate uh, uh, as, a, as a jurist, as a legal professional, uh, participate in any training that is provided by the Council of Europe? Uh, yeah, so I understand we just respond straight away to the questions, then I will. Uh, so, uh, welcome, first of all, to the community, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy you are taking up the issues of discrimination, which I think uh, for lawyers is an important part of their reflections. Not even if you, even if you don't specialize in it, I think for lawyers who are dealing with rights and human rights in particular, they need to have uh, also the glasses to see, okay, what discriminatory or structural discriminatory issues are in there that affect a case, even if it's not specifically about discrimination. So I'm happy you're taking this up. I think it's, it's, a, it's welcomed. 
Uh, about your question, so there are um, a few avenues. One thing I would like to invite you is to look at the HELP program, which is HELP, uh, it's uh, uh, um, online learning for uh, legal professionals. Um, it's basically help.coe.int. There are many courses there that are uh, open, uh, so you don't need to register, well, you need to register for the course, but you can go on your own speed individually. And then there are uh, courses that are moderated and normally they are organized at a national level. So there will be, a, it will be in the national language of that country and there will be moderators from that country that are giving additional assignments and there will be webinars and things like that. So there's two different things. Um, I'm not sure how much help or what's happening regarding help now in Turkey, but you can find it on the website. So that's one thing to really look into because there's lots of open source materials there on many different subtopics, including a new course that's going to be launched on hate speech, uh, totally revised hate speech and hate crime. I think it's very good. It's online or will be online uh, this fall. I'm, not quite, I think, I'm sorry, I'm, I think it's September or that it will be online. Uh, on discrimination and, and violence against women is also a very uh, good course there on access to rights for women to, to, judici to judiciary recourse. So that's one. Second of all, um, men, the Council of Europe has various cooperation programs, including with Turkey. And depending on the program and depending on the needs, uh, legal professionals are invited as or are stakeholders that can be trained. Uh, normally, we work with partner organizations like the the, the high uh, the high uh, the how do you call it the the higher educational um, council or academy for lawyers or the bar associations. So I would also uh, check the Council of Europe's website in Turkey uh, to in, in Ankara to check what programs are now active uh, in uh, in Turkey uh, from the Council of Europe. Uh, and on what topics and then see if this is relevant for you and uh, would enhance your career. So please go explore. There are lots of possibilities there. Plus, if you have new ideas, I'm sure that uh, our partners there in, in uh, Turkey are interested to receive new ideas and the new programs could also be developed if there is a need. Uh, so we are also open for feedback and suggestions from your side. While going into the second question, um, Menno, could you maybe also put the links about the projects and the programs that you've mentioned on the chat box as well? If you could put them in the chat box, uh, then everybody can hear, the, uh, can see them, I think. Um, Mina has raised her hand as well. I'm trying to find you at the moment, or you can unmute yourself if you can. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. I, but, um, okay, it's much more audible at the moment. That's fine. Your voice is coming out fine. I could attend a little later, as a matter of fact, than uh, the uh, discussion started, but for the part that I participated in, it was uh, very informative. Thank you very much for that. I have a question for Özge. As far as I understand, you have online trainings for asylum seekers or for refugees in Turkey. I'm wondering whether a series of trainings in which the participants could be followed up later on happened or not. And also, in your target group, as far as I can understand, you have try to ensure that you include everybody in your trainings, but have people, have some people been left behind, do you think? Not being covered, because yes, they need those digital tools, they need computers, for example, they need a smartphone or something like that in order to connect. And for some people who really wanted to join, did you provide them with a technical tool or something like that so that they can connect? So first of all, some of the trainings were series of meetings. As a matter of fact, you said that you had missed the beginning, especially for 
life skills and professional skills uh, trainings, we have a series of trainings. So this is a series of trainings that are consecutive. And we have also one-off trainings as well. And these are for, uh, both types of trainings can be given for women. Have, there, have some people been left behind? Yes. I couldn't really uh, focus on this uh, issue, but NGOs like Yuva had to sit down and talk to their donors, as a matter of fact, in order to adapt to this new uh, process, its methodologies. And that was a process. And of course, our relationship with each donor wasn't always, um, let's say, comfortable. Now, this could be because of the conditions that are brought on by COVID-19 or something else, some infallibility on the side of the donor. But as far as the donors allowed us, we could provide with certain devices. Uh, we could provide uh, certain people with certain devices so that they could connect. Or, for example, the distribution of SIM cards with internet capability on them. But of course, we couldn't do this every time. And also, these are very costly things as well. They're not really cheap. Therefore, some people have been left behind, I'm sorry to say. I believe there is no addition to the um, question. As far as I understand, some NGOs have also been working with other companies who sell second-hand smartphones or who repair smartphones and improve them and distribute them to the people as well. But of course, uh, if you can't have a one-on-one -on -one meeting, for example, with the people who are going to actually use them and who don't know how to use them, then uh, that could be an issue, I suppose. I'm looking for other people who have maybe raised their hands. Maybe while people think about the questions, um, the previous questions was about the links. I, I work from my phone, uh, also for security reasons, I couldn't use Zoom on the, on the computer of work. Uh, so I sent the links to our colleagues at uh, the foundation. So if they could uh, post it in the chat on my behalf, that would be really nice. So I posted there about the manuals of the youth department, the, the document on the anti-discrimination department on COVID impact on uh, uh, disadvantaged groups, um, the manuals on count, uh, hate speech, bookmarks and we can, and the uh, intercultural cities program on municipalities and the health program. So they're all there. I believe it's shared now. I hope that everyone can see it. Now I'm going to turn back to our participants. I see that Recep Küçük is raising his hand. The floor is yours. Can you hear me? It's too low, but we can hear you. How about now? We can hear you now. I would like to ask Menno a question. We talked about no hate speech. As far as I know, as far as I can observe, people's behaviors on online and offline can differ, their characters can differ. Sometimes they behave differently online as compared to offline. offline. And online platforms are uh, very suitable to do that, to act differently. Therefore, when it comes to hate speech, can we uh, talk about anything specific to focus on uh, when it comes to people's attitudes, people's behaviors? Can we focus on anything specific to address that?
Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you're raising a, a major concern. I think the, um, the inhibition for people uh, in the online space, inhibition meaning that people feel no barriers to just share and say whatever they want, I, I think is in part is the result of not having physically somebody in front of you that reminds you of certain social um, agreements that we have between us, that you don't certain, say certain things to people in, in a certain way uh, because it offends and it has an impact on others. And I think most, uh, most of us are inclined to be respectful of other people's emotions and feelings. Um, because if not, it also really undermines the community, community spirit, and it undermines together getting better and to met, together uh, solving problems that the community has. I mean, I don't need to agree with everything that somebody else has said, um, but I do need to listen to that person and take their perspectives into account when solving problems. And I think in the online space, um, we also want to comment on social problems on issues and want to share our opinion but because of the inhibition of having somebody opposite you that reminds you of the difference of perspectives um yeah you might feel um un, um unlimited in what you're saying and i think the um going back to artificial intelligence algorithms the filter bubbles that we are often talking about so that you are only speaking to like-minded people uh exaggerates the makes the problem of course worse i think in that sense for us to address hate speech is not only about um, um, restricting it because i think many governments are looking into legislation now to only hate speech and to say to criminalize certain forms of hate speech i think while we need a red line so there needs to be a clear red line this is unacceptable uh, speech for example because it calls for violence or it calls for discrimination uh, lots of speech might be very uncomfortable, uh, discriminatory, but we should not criminalize it. Uh, but, but there are lots of, because we also have freedom of expression and freedom of assembly as a, as a right. However, there's lots of other actions to do. Self-regulatory measures, uh, certain platforms can regulate what is acceptable speech. Um, journalists can regulate and, and can have self-regulatory on how they report on, on certain issues. Um, and we need to look at awareness raising and education and part of the education is media literacy to understand um, the impact of your speech the how it spreads online how it can also uh, evolve out of context uh, so maybe you want to say certain things but it is not perceived that way or it goes into different platforms and it reaches into an out of context uh, safe space i think we also need to teach people that they are not anonymous online um, and and uh, that it has a major impact. So we also again need to go back to human rights education, where we learn that to see different perspectives and to understand the impact of certain things that you are saying on other people. So this is also about intercultural learning, intercultural dialogue, and this needs to be part of the media literacy training that we do. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a whole package deal and uh, the No Hate Speech Movement gave us a lot of uh, information and, and knowledge about how to address this, how to address this through education. So I encourage you to use the manuals uh, in that regard. And the Council of Europe learned a lot on finding the balance between regulation, criminalization, education, awareness raising. And we are now starting a process of drafting a new Committee of Ministers recommendation on hate speech, on combating hate speech within the human rights framework. That whole thing, combating hate speech within the human rights framework, that's very important. Um, and to really see this as a comprehensive process. So it's not only about regulation and law, but about the whole package that member states should be doing, which means investing in youth work, investing in education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. It's not so straightforward to address it. I think that is a reality. We, this is a continuous process of learning, awake, raising awareness, et cetera. Okay, thank you very much for your question, Mr. Recep, and for your answer. I am looking to see if there is a final question that we can take. If anybody would like to take the floor, we have time for one last question. Okay, I see no question, but let me check. If not, we can wrap up. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Menno. Thank you very much, Özge. We tried to rethink about anti-discrimination measures. We talked about non-formal training uh, methods, what we did uh, in different pl platforms before pandemic and what we are doing now because pandemic changed our lives all of a sudden for all of us. And people in the field of human rights would know sometimes we get interventions in certain fields, uh, activists or um, humanitarian aid uh, personnel are faced with that but now everybody is faced with this uh, uh, new situation and there are new needs to be addressed as we are working in the field of human rights we uh, attach great importance to the needs of people first of all we analyze people's needs this is what you both said and we said that people can sometimes think that they can hide themselves while they express hate speech uh, on online platforms and uh, this should be focused on as well this is a uh, non this is a kind of non-stop work actually we have to keep combating hate speech and discrimination and this meeting is um, a great way of doing that so if you have any um, thing to add i will one last time give the floor to you menno i will give the floor to you if you have anything to add No, I not much to add. I think it is it's good to have these uh, these webinars, and I hope this is an invitation for many to look into uh, existing resources, and to also con contribute to the community. I think the challenge now is to move some of the work that we do to the online space, and to do that uh, in a way that we still respect the principles of human rights education and the principles of non formal learning, which is needs-based, participatory, human rights-based, uh, building knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Um, so there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, learning that we can do now together. Uh, so please uh, share uh, promising practices, uh, share among each other new resources that you come across. Uh, um, also things that didn't go well, uh, we can learn a lot from that. Um, I'm available in that sense, um, so please be in touch with me or, or my colleagues if you have anything to share. And the youth department is organizing uh, what we call study sessions and has also a grant, uh, grant program. So if you uh, work for a youth organization and you're interested to work on new methodologies related to COVID, then there's opportunities to apply for a study session, which is an online or offline training course, depending on the situation or our grants uh, to support this. And I think we need to respond and we, we need to respond now. So please share, uh, please engage and, uh, and let's address this together. Thank you very much. We talked about the advantages of online meetings. And one of the advantages is, for example, that we were able to reach a menno. It was easier for us to reach him rather than getting together physically. This was one of the advantages, for example. So uh, our responsibility is to find these positive sides and uh, keep helping each other. Okay, I would like to remind one more thing before giving the floor to Özge. Uh, this kind of work is quite new. So, uh, please give please give us some feedback. Gusha shared our links uh, in the chat part with you. So please send us your feedback. We are trying to get better uh, in this kind of work. So now I will give the floor to Özge. First of all, I would like to thank all, all participants for their patience for keeping online. Uh, at this time, I hope that their expectations were met. I attach great importance to civil society sharing uh, things with each other, learning from each other. So I agree with Menno, let's keep in contact. I am here if there's anything that I can 
do for you. I would like to thank Grant Singh Foundation for their invitation and I would like to thank all stakeholders involved in this project. Is there anyone from the team who would like to say something before we wrap up? Let me see. Okay, I get the message. Once again, I would like to thank all of you, especially you, Menno, especially you, Özge, and I would like to thank the team who organized this webinar, and I would like to thank our translators for helping us. Our way of doing our work, our methods are changing, our challenges are changing, but now we see that this kind of sharing platforms can increase in number. Let's be in touch, let's touch each other, let's support each other. We all share this life in the society. We are all in contact with each other. So this kind of learning platforms is very important. A combat, a war, can start all of a sudden but learning from each other in a peaceful way is more difficult but it's more meaningful and it's stronger so let's try to do that so please take care of each other until next time <laughs>